Praise the Lord. Do you believe that tonight? Do you believe that your praise is a weapon? Yes. yes. Have I convinced you of it yet? I'm still trying to convince some of us that our praise is a weapon. That if our praise causes God to, if God inhabits the praises of his people, if he's enthroned on our praises, then what does that mean? That means when we praise him, we, we place him in the rightful place where he's supposed to be. We put him on the throne. And what happens when we praise him in the midst of the circumstance, when we praise him in the trial, when we praise him when we're facing, when we're battling, when we've got sickness or relationships or just junk in our life, when we praise him, we take the junk off the throne and we put him back on the throne. Because right. yes. worry is just praise in the wrong direction. Worry is praise in the problem. Right? So when we praise, we kick the worry off the throne and we put Jesus back on the throne. That's right? Yes. right? Yes. That's why I keep telling you, the singing part isn't just what we do to warm up for the preaching. This singing thing, this praising thing, it's important. It tears down strongholds. It gets Jesus on the throne. And when Jesus is on the throne, then we unleash him to move and work in our lives. I don't know about you. I need him to work in my life. Yes. I can't do it. If it was in my power to do some stuff, it would already be done, but it's not in my power. I've got to kick worry and my self-confidence off the throne and get him on the throne. And praise does that. Right? right? So we're not, we're not just getting set up for the word. The, word uh, the, the praise doesn't set up the word. The praise is just praise. <laughs> the praise is just what we're supposed to do. I was teaching my girls this past week, Psalm 150, verse 6. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. We learned that verse this last week. And I just emphasize that last part. I make them shout it. Praise the Lord. I'm, I'm going to have little Pentecostal girls. I promise you that. They're going to be wild burning ones for Jesus. If I have anything to do with it, that's what they're going to be. If I have anything to do with it, they're not going to worry what people think about them. I already see it trying to creep into grace and just break that crud off of her. No, it's not going to happen. Oh. Hmm. Glory to God. So we already smell tacos when we walked in, so I understand I'm under the gun when it comes to preaching. But I, I want to preach on a miracle of Jesus. We've looked at 16 miracles of Jesus. Tonight, we're going to look at another miracle of Jesus. And I tell you what, every time I see a miracle uh, that Jesus has performed, it reminds me of the breakthroughs that are possible because he's living in me. Amen? He's living in me. He's residing in my heart through the Holy Spirit. When, when John said, greater is he that is in the world, greater is he that's in you than is in the world, let me say the verse right. <laughs> greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. He's not talking about your spirit. He's not talking about your self-will that's inside of you. He's talking about Jesus living in you. So when I start seeing these miracles, I'm re reminded my faith is stirred up. I'm reminded that what's impossible for me is still possible for him. That, that Jesus looks at water and the laws of physics are optional. Right? The physics that apply to water, right? When we step in water, we, we go down. When he decides to step on water and wants to make it something he can walk across, he can do that. <laughs> That's pretty awesome. And so when I see these miracles, I'm reminded of what's possible inside of me because he's inside of me. Yes. Yes. That there's already breakthroughs inside of me just waiting to get out. There's already healings and miracles inside of me just waiting to get out. There's already people to be set free. They're just waiting to be prayed for by me That's right. yeah. and by you, by the way. They're just waiting for a point of contact from heaven and you're the point of contact. Because Jesus is in you. And what you have is all, you got it. You have what you need. It's in you. Jesus in you. It's, it's what you need. So I want you to turn to Matthew chapter 14. We're going to look at a, a fairly, well, m most of these miracles, we've all read about these miracles before. But as we read them, let it stir faith inside of you. Realize that this is the living, active word of God. Do we believe that the word of God is active tonight? Yes. 
that the word of God can stir something up inside of us, that the word of God can remind something that maybe has been laying dormant for a little while. It can, it can reactivate something inside of us that, that causes us to go, whoa, that's in me. That Jesus is, is living in me right now. Awesome. So uh, Matthew chapter 14, verse 13. Now when Jesus heard this, here's what he's just heard. He's just heard that John, his cousin, has been beheaded in prison. He hears this, and he withdrew from there in a boat to a desolate place. I, I just want to remind you, Jesus had some hard days too. Jesus lost some people that he loved too. You know why he withdrew to a desolate place? Because he loved John. Because John was the forerunner to his ministry. John laid the foundation. He was the one that came as a voice in the wilderness saying, prepare the way of the Lord. He loved John. He loved John. And he finds out John has died. And he just wants to go away. And I believe he wants to mourn for this loss. So, sometimes we think that... <laughs> You know, we remember the cross part and remember, man, that was awful what Jesus went through on the cross. But we forget sometimes that he lost people too as he was walking on this earth. And it hurt him just like it, it hurts us when we go through loss and pain. When he lost Lazarus, shortest verse in the Bible, uh, John 13, 35, Jesus wept. Maybe one of those most powerful verses in the Bible though too. That reminds us that Jesus... Uh, doesn't shy away from our pain, our brokenness, our hurt, but he embraces it. He knows that he's about to call Lazarus out of the tomb, but he still chooses to feel the pain in that moment. And so here's Jesus, he's withdrawing, he's going to a desolate place by himself, but the crowds heard it, and they followed him on foot from the towns. And when he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion on them, and he healed their sick. <sighs> compassion. I just want to remind you, everything hinges on Jesus' compassion. The reason why we want to pray and see breakthrough for people in healing is because Jesus has compassion on people. I think when Jesus sees sickness, he, he doesn't look at that and go, oh, I just want you to grin and bear it and get through it. I believe he has compassion and he realizes what the enemy has stole from humanity. Sick bodies weren't part of God's original plan. They weren't. And I'm not up here to try to explain why everybody doesn't get healed. I don't know why. But what I do know is that Jesus has compassion and he wants to heal the sick. So I'll lean into what I do know. I know that's what Jesus wants to do. He has compassion when he sees people hurting and broken and sick in body. And he wants to heal. So I'll just lean into that and I'll leave the other part to the realm of mystery that's uh, above my pay grade to steal a line from our former president. <clears throat> Remember when the president of the United States said that, that something was above his break, pay grade? How's that possible when you're the president? Anyway, not, not to get political. I'm really not political at all. Uh, I'm just saying, he said that, and it's kind of funny to me, but this one is above my pay grade. I don't understand why some people get healed, some people don't. I don't get it. But what I can stand on is that Jesus is a healer. And I know that's true. And I know that when he sees the sick, when he sees people afflicted, when he sees people in bondage, that compassion rises within him and he has to do something about it. So to come back to my first rambling part about praise, that's why we want to praise Jesus. We want him to be enthroned in this room so that the people in here that are struggling, they can be met with the compassion of Jesus. My compassion only goes so far. Jesus' compassion is infinite. So when we welcome him in this place through our praise, we're, we're giving him the opportunity to let that compassion rise up within him and start ministering to people. Man. So Jesus has compassion. And he starts healing the sick. And when it was evening, the disciples came to him. And they said, this is a des desolate place. And the day is now over. Send the crowds away to go into the villages and to buy them food for themselves. I want you to notice uh, the setup for the miracle. Do, do you realize the setup for every miracle is somebody's sick, somebody's demon possessed, <sighs> somebody's dead? 
The setup for miracles are desolate places. Yay. We all say we want miracles, but do you realize wh when you need a miracle, it means you're in a bad spot? So what if, what if we could change the way we looked at our desolate places? I'm still speaking English, right? Some of y'all looking at me like I'm talking in Spanish. I don't know. <clears throat> what, what if we changed the way we looked at our desolate places? What, what if we started to believe that desolate places are exactly where Jesus loves to show up and show off? What if instead of every time we got into a desolate place, we ran around going, oh, this is so bad. What if we started praising God for the desolate place, realizing that this is exactly where miracles show up, is in bad spots, desolate places, the hard times. That's where Jesus shows up. You know, it's... <laughs> I, I remember hearing Holly heard a testimony of one of the men that were, uh, one of the men, and he was in the underground church in China. Was it in China or Korea, North Korea? One of, one of the places where it's not good to be a Christian, okay? And part of his punishment was that they were sending him out into the place where all the sewage ran out, and they made him stand in the sewage for hours on end. This is what they were doing to this man because he wouldn't renounce his faith. And when he got, when he got delivered from having to stand in the sewage all the time, he said something that kind of rocked Holly's world and when she shared it with me, it messed me up. He said, I long to be able to go back and stand in that sewage because God met me in that sewage like I've never met him before. His presence showed up and was so real in that sewage that when I got free from it, I wanted to go back because I've never experienced his presence like that before. What if, instead of griping about the desolate place, we chose to say, God, this is where you show up the best? What if we started saying, this is your opportunity to move? So here, they, this is a desolate place. There's nothing for these people. Verse 16, but Jesus said, they don't need to go away. You give them something to eat. They said to him, we only have five loaves here and two fish. He said, bring them here to me. Then he ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass. And taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heavens and he said a blessing. Then he broke the loaves and he gave them to the disciples. And the disciples gave them to the crowds. And they all ate and were satisfied. And when they took up 12 basketfuls, and, and when it was over, they took up 12 basketfuls of the broken pieces left over. And those who ate were about 5,000 men, besides women and children. So in the midst of this desolate place, Jesus shows up and shows out. Oh. Here's the first thing that I want you to see. I got, I got a real good preachery sermon tonight. Three points, okay? Three points. First thing I want you to see tonight is that all that God ever asked for is what's already in our hands. It's amazing what God can do when we'll give him what's in our hands. And... and in one of the parallel accounts to this passage, one of the disciples say, we've got five fish and two loaves, but <laughs> what good will that do with this massive crowd, basically? How many times we look at the need in the world around us and we go, but, but what good will what we have do with all this need around us? 
We're looking at situations and it's like, what good can I do? This is all I got. Any of you guys facing some situations where it feels like you've got a lack, you've got limited resources, there's not enough to actually meet the need? That's exactly where Jesus is in this moment. They don't have enough to meet the need. Some of you, you're facing situations. You don't have enough. You don't have enough faith to keep going. Right? Come on, man. Hush. You don't know where the money for the bill's going to come from. You don't know how the relationship's going to get fixed. You don't know how the kid's going to come home. You don't know. You, you, what you have is limited. But here's the deal. All Jesus wants is what you have. Just open up your hands and give him what you have. As silly and as small as it may seem, just give him what you've got. All the disciples have, five loaves, two fish. But it's amazing what Jesus can do when we give him what we have. Here, here's the key. Again, yield. Just yield what you've got. Just yield what you've got. God is really good at taking what's in people's hands and using it for his glory. Remember Moses? He has this encounter with God and all he has in his hands is a stick. It's his shepherd's staff, so it's important, it's vital to what he was doing as a shepherd. And what does God ask for? He says, Moses, throw your staff on the ground. Give me what's in your hands. He throws it on the ground, turns into a snake. I would have thought that was the devil in the burning bush at that point, as much as I hate snakes. <laughs> but he throws what's in his hands down. And it's God showing, again, all I need is what's in your hands. You don't have to figure out the details. Just give me what you've got. You, you've got some worry about what's going on? We'll give that to God. <laughs> Just give him what's in your hands. See what he'll do with it. But too many of us want to hold on because logically we can take that five loaves and two fish and we can feed a couple of people if we keep it. I promise you there was somebody had they been acting in what we call wisdom would have said, don't, don't give that to Jesus. Let's feed three or four and send the rest home. I'm glad sometimes Jesus uses uncommon sense. <laughs> Jesus says, give me what's in your hands. It, it may not look like much, but let me get a hold of it and I'll do something with it. So give Jesus what's in your hands. Second thing I want you to see is what looks like breaking is actually how God multiplies. What looks like breaking is how God multiplies. So Jesus takes the bread and he starts breaking it. And in breaking the bread, he multiplies it out to people. Uh, sometimes you're going to have to be broken so that love can be multiplied. Sometimes before the miracle comes through, sometimes before the breakthrough comes, through, comes in, you're going to have to be broke. Sorry. But sometimes before the breakthrough, you've got to be broken. So let him break you. And it'll be all right. I think we have the greatest act of love that we've ever seen. Where Jesus, uh, I can't help but think about Jesus breaking that bread. And then on Passover one night, his last meal with his disciple, breaking the bread and saying, this is my body. I can't help but connect these two moments together and see them parallel. Where Jesus in this moment is breaking bread and he's multiplying it to thousands. And I think it's a picture of his body being broken and how he's going to allow his one broken body to be broken and multiplied to every person that would ever put their faith in him him. The miracle would actually come in his, in his breaking. Sometimes as we're broken, love is multiplied. Power is multiplied. Miracles are multiplied as we allow the Lord to break us. 
I'm thankful that Jesus allowed himself to be broken for us. And the last thing that I see here, and this goes along with giving what's in your hands. <laughs> but the last thing I see here is that your lack actually sets you up for his abundance. Your lack sets you up for his abundance. What they didn't have was food. That was their lack. His abundance was everybody gets fed and leftovers. <laughs> Isn't, I know I say this a lot, but man, God is awesome to me. And how he works is awesome to me. And I look at this and I go, man, and with their little, with their nothing, with their lack, God takes it and he proves his abundance. Oh. Our lack, what we don't have, actually sets us up to receive from the abundance of heaven. So again, what if we changed our mindset and we quit focusing in on what we don't have and realize that what we don't have is just setting us up for what he has? If we'll just give him what's in our hands, if we'll just trust him with what we've got, our lack will set us up for his abundance. And, and I, I think that one of the things that we can draw from this is that there are times, there are times when you are empty, when you are dry, when you are broken, and what you need to do in that season is you need to give. And I'm not even talking about financially. I'm talking about you feel like you don't have anything, but you go, God, I don't have anything in myself, but I'm going to find somebody that I can pour into. I'm going to find somebody that I can serve. I'm going to do something that causes me not to focus in on my lack. I'm going to, I'm going to look at blessing somebody else. I believe that that can be a key for breakthrough in people's lives. Because we get so isolated. We get so focused in on me and my needs and what I don't have and all the problems around me, and it, and it drains us. When you focus on that, it drains you. So the best way to quit focusing in on what you don't have is to lift your eyes, find somebody else in need, and pour into them. Serve when you don't feel like serving. Give when you don't have anything to give. And then see what God won't do. Because I think God just has this amazing way of providing supernaturally to us when we get our eyes off of ourselves. I think for some of us, the key to our breakthrough, the key to our healing, might be that we pray for somebody else's healing. Eric Johnson is one of the senior leaders at Bethel Church in Redding, California. It's an amazing church. I believe it's one of the places where God is genuinely on the move in the earth. Like God is just doing some powerful things there. And he's deaf. He, he's, he's, he, he can speak, but he's, he's pretty much deaf in his ears. And he talks about how he has prayed for hundreds of people for deafness. And he's seen them be healed. And God's left him deaf. And he doesn't understand it. But he says, I keep praying for these people and I keep believing that one of these days I'm going to have my hearing restored. <sighs> so I'm just saying, what, what if in the midst of your weakness, God actually wants to do what he says in his word? He wants to prove his strength. What if where you're broken, that's where he wants to use you to bring healing to others? Would you be cool with that? Because because I know it might be hard. On our flesh, it might be hard to go, well, God, I prayed for them, and they got healed, and here I am. I'm trying to do your work, and you're not doing anything for me. But you know what I think will happen in that? You'll see breakthroughs in others, and you'll just start 
you'll just start slowly deciding, I'm not going to stay focused in on me. I'm going to keep my eyes up. And I'm going to keep serving others. And I'm going to keep loving Jesus. And as I pour out from my lack, his abundance, his abundance, his abundance, his abundance will keep pouring through me. And if all I am is just a, a connection point, if I can just be something he pours into so he can pour out into others, I'm fine with that. Amen? I, oh, that stirs something up in me. Something's stirring inside of me. I, I, I believe right now, I, I understand, with the people in this room, each one of us are probably facing some sort of desolate situation. And so what, what I'm, I'm trying to say is by faith, start to see this desolate situation differently. Start to see that God's put something in your hands for this season, for this moment that you're in. That there's something in you. Greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. There's already something in you that's in your hands that if you'll give it to the Lord and allow him to break it, if you'll allow him to break you, he can multiply it. In this place of desolation, he might just turn that into a place of abundance and breakthrough. The place that was a graveyard might turn into a place bursting with life. But you've got to choose to see it differently. You've got to choose to open up your hands. You've got to choose to give it to the Lord. Amen? Colton, will you come? Here's what I want to do is Colton leads us in one last song. I just want to invite us to, to pray into those situations. And here's what I want you to do. Don't agree with the desolation. You understand? Sometimes when we pray, we start agreeing with the enemy. We start agreeing with how dark and broken and messed up it is. We're not going to agree with the enemy. We're going to agree that as we praise and we invite Jesus into the situation, that in our lack, there's abundance coming. So we're going to praise from the point of, he's about to change this. He's about to take the lack that I have and pour out his abundance. So don't, don't pray from agreement with what's broken. Pray from agreement with what's whole in Jesus. What's right in Jesus. Do you, do you understand what I'm saying? Pray from that place. Not, oh, this is so messed up, but oh God, this is such a great opportunity for you to, to show up. Oh God, here's all these hungry, starving people and here's just this great opportunity for you to show up and manifest your glory and your power and to prove who you are. Here's an opportunity for you to multiply your love, your glory, your grace into our lives. Here's an opportunity for you to work, God. This test is going to lead to my testimony, right? So pray from agreement with heaven, not agreement with your situation. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. The altar is going to be open if you want to come and pray up here. Um, and, and if you come up here, we're going to pray for you too. So that's just how I feel. If you come up here, I want to pray with you, stand with you uh, in agreement and just let you know you're not in it alone. Isn't it good to be in a room with people tonight that are saying, hey, this place that looks desolate, here we are, we by faith believe God's going to turn it around. He's going to show up. He's going to move. I'm glad to be with a group of people on a Sunday night that believe with God all things are possible. I can't get this watching TV at home. All right? That's why I come here. So I can be with people that have faith. So I can be with God's people and they can stir something inside of me and, and causes me to get my eyes off myself and, and the world and get my eyes back on Jesus. Thank you, Lord. We believe, we confess, Jesus, tonight that the place of desolation for us is a place of breakthrough for you. And if we have to be broken, we lay ourselves down and we say, break us, God, so that your glory can be multiplied. Lord, and we thank you that this place of desolation, Lord, it's not going to stay that way. That God, this place where we don't see how breakthrough can come, this place that seems like a, a place of lack, God, this is the very place where you show up and you show your abundance. This is the place where you show up and you show that you're the God of possible. So I just praise you, Lord, for breakthroughs in this place. I, I praise you, Lord, that you've stirred up inside of us 
and that we remember who we are. That Jesus, you're in us. Jesus, you're in us. And you're greater than any situation we're facing. We confess that tonight. In Jesus' name.